and let's pray. Father, we need you. Uh, we want you here. Uh, most especially, we plead for your Holy Spirit uh, to move amongst us and to move in us and through us. Lord, I pray that you'd uh, help us to find application for your eternal truth in our finite lives, that we could be benefited by it, profited by it, so that our lives could be richer, fuller, more abundant as you desired to give us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us now. In your name we pray. Amen. We finished Philippians chapter 1 uh, a little bit ago, and uh, we had the Lord's Supper service last week, and so we move on to chapter 2. Uh, chapter 2 is just rich. Um, again, I love the book of Philippians. It's probably one of the more encouraging passages of Scripture in the entire Word of God. Uh, people often run to uh, the Psalms for comfort and soothing. Uh, if I need encouragement, I run to Philippians. Uh, and, and it's an easy read. I'll normally sit down and just power through it and just let it, let it speak to me, let it capture my heart and my mind. Uh, but as we go through and take a look at it, we'll find that Paul uh, truly loved the church at Philippi. Uh, if Thessalonica is probably one of the more successful churches, uh, certainly the church at Ephesus was the largest of all the churches, uh, the church at Philippi was probably the most beloved of all of uh, Paul's church plants, and, and the language that he uses is, is evident. Uh, we get down here after he's done some introductory remarks and uh, talking about uh, our, our desire to be like Christ and that if we're going to live as Christ in this world, we've got to understand that there is some suffering. Uh, and that's where he ends up at the end of chapter 1. Uh, but in chapter 2, he begins with four rhetorical statements. And we want to look at those. Uh, he gives four rhetorical statements, and then he's going to have a request for the church. Uh, and in that request are some things that we need to do in order to fulfill his request. Again, all of this given by inspiration of God through his Holy Spirit, through Paul, and to us. So let's read there, chapter 2, verse 1. It says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father, Wherefore, my, dearly, uh, wherefore my, my beloved, uh, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And we're going to stop there. I'm not even sure I'm going to get that far down there, but we'll see what happens. Uh, we're going to go back to verse 1. He says there, again, four rhetorical statements. He says, if there, if there be, therefore, any consolation. So he's saying, listen. Uh, church, let me ask you a question. He says, is there any consolation in Christ? Any consolation in Christ? And the, the statement or the question is rhetorical, meaning yes, there is. But let's take a look at it for a moment. I need somebody to look up Luke chapter 2 and verse 25. Who can look that up for me? Luke 2, 25. Brother Brett, you got it. Uh, how about 2 Corinthians 1, 5? Brother Dave, I need 2 Thessalonians 2, 16. 2 Thessalonians, I'm going to leave that to our adults right now, Casey. I'll let you do it, 2 Thessalonians 2.16. All right. Brother Brad, are you ready? Luke 2.25. <laughs> All right. Okay, so 
The Bible says that this man named Simon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Who was that? It was Peter. Uh, Jesus Christ. He's waiting for Jesus Christ. He was waiting for the... Simon said it. I, I knew where you were going. Um, but uh, he, he was waiting for Christ. Christ is the consolation. He says, if there be any consolation in Christ, not only is there consolation in Christ, Christ is the consolation of God. He's the consolation of Israel. Okay? So 2 Corinthians 1.5. And there, our consolation abounds by Christ. So Christ is the consolation of Israel, and now we have a consolation that abounds because of Christ. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 16. Okay. Christ has given us everlasting consolation. So this rhetorical statement that Paul throws out there, he says, if there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ. So the question then is, well, is there a consolation in the Christ? And the answer is, yes. He's the consolation of Israel. He's provided a consolation. He's the eternal consolation. Uh, so we have this answer to our, our, our rhetorical question, yes, there's consolation in Christ. Then he says, rhetorical statement number two, if any, comfort of love. And I have to, I have to say this. I, I read a great quote uh, from Spurgeon on the consolation. It says, the Holy Spirit consoles, but Christ is the consolation. The Holy Spirit is the physician, but Christ is the medicine. Uh, a, a great statement and a wonderful way to think about it. The Holy Spirit does console us, but Christ is that consolation. The Holy Spirit serves as kind of our physician, but Christ is the actual medicine uh, that uh, provides help and grace and time of need. Uh, so the second statement, if there be any comfort of love. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1.3, I think you had that, Brother Dave, or you were at 1.5. Can you look up 1.3? Yeah, 2 Corinthians 1.3. Okay, so God is the God of all comfort, and uh, he's providing that. He's provided that through his son, Jesus Christ. And, and the word comfort here, when we think of the word comfort, we think of like a soothing, like you're comforting a crying baby. It's, oh, it's okay. And uh, that, that's not necessarily the word that's used here in the Greek. Uh, when we think of the word comfort here, we want to think of something more like a fortress, comfort. All right. You want to think of it as a fortress. It's it's a it's, it's a coming alongside. It's a it's a strengthening. It's a it's a grace that's applied. It's um it's a bolstering up. It's a providing of of bravery almost. It's it's uh, having uh, someone come alongside of you and say uh, you know I've got your back in this. So any comfort of love and what happens is that uh, the love of God makes us strong. And brave. It empowers us to do things that we wouldn't normally do because, well, to be real honest, uh, outside, of, outside of faith, uh, any sort of bravado is more of arrogance and pride. But any, uh, what does the Bible say? Uh, the righteous are as bold as a lion. Why? Because when we walk with God and he walks alongside of us, we have him for our help. And when we feel the love of God and we understand the love of God and are, are helped by the love of God. Listen, one of, the, one of the saddest things to see is a Christian who thinks that God doesn't love him. It, it's, it, they, they come to church, Pastor, uh, how's your week? Fine. Uh, how's life? Okay. What's wrong? I, I just don't think God loves me. <laughs> Wait, time out. Hold on. You say, does it happen all the time? In fact, I, I dare say that with people sitting in this room, at, at least half of us at one point in our faith life, we've considered the fact that, you know what? I wonder if God really loves me. When we've already been to the cross and seen the greatest example of love that has ever been given. 
And so we wonder and we ask God to God, show me your love. And so Paul here, under the inspiration of the Spirit, is asking, is there any comfort of love? And the answer is most definitely. When we come alongside and God draws alongside of us, it's amazing what a Christian can do when they realize the love that God has for them. One of the reasons why we're talking about real love on Sunday mornings is so that we can understand how God loves us in the manifold ways that he demonstrates that and how we demonstrate that to others. Because when we grasp hold of the fact that God loves us, not because of who we are, not because of what we do, because of who he is, we are able to do so much more in life than just what we can do. We're now empowered. We're now strengthened. We're now encouraged for service. He says there in statement number three, he says, if any fellowship of the Spirit, any fellowship of the Spirit. I need somebody to look up Romans chapter 8 and verse uh, 11. Who can look that up for me? Brother Randall, Romans 8, 11. I got another one here. 1 Corinthians 2, 16. 1 Corinthians 2, 16. I'll let you take that one too. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. Talking about fellowship of the Spirit. Brother Randall, you got that? Please. Yes, sir. Okay. So we're talking about fellowship of the Spirit. Romans chapter 8 is written to those that are born again. So we're talking to Christians, believers. And he says there, if the Spirit of God that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in you why does he dwell in us so that he can speak to us so that he can help us so that he can guide us he's not there just taking up residence because he doesn't have room in heaven he's there for a purpose and it's for the purpose of fellowshipping uh the men sat down for breakfast yesterday and we fellowshipped we interacted together. We learned about each other's weeks. We learned uh, things that we had seen and heard. We, we learned uh, the things that are going on in each other's lives while we eat bacon. All right. Uh, you had me at bacon. Uh, but we, we, we enjoyed some bacon, and I think there were eggs and other things, but we had bacon. And, and we fellowshipped, and we, we, we had an enjoyable time. Uh, and and it's because we were we were co-located in a space, and when the Holy Spirit comes in, He is there for the purpose of interacting with us, and not just a, a a monthly meeting type, but on a moment by moment basis, He's there to help us, to guide us, to teach us. So it's the fellowship. Uh, give me that next verse, First Corinthians two ten. Okay, so the Bible tells us that God hath revealed them to us by what method? By spirit. Well, his spirit has to do something with us in order for him to, to reveal that to us. He's got to fellowship. He's got to testify. He's got to teach. He's got to guide. And so the Holy Spirit resides within us, and he's fellowshipping with us. So then Paul's rhetorical statement here, if any fellowship of the spirit, is there fellowship of the spirit? And the answer is, obviously, yes, there has to be, because that's his job and what he's doing. He resides within us to fellowship, to testify, to interact with us. And then he says there, his last rhetorical statement is, if there are any bowels and mercies. Now, uh, when he says bowels, he's not talking about the fact that we all have gastrointestinal tracts. That's not the issue. Um, uh, and, and not talking about the issues of those gastrointestinal tracts. That's between you and your physician. Uh, he's, he's talking about compassions, the deep yearnings that we have. Uh, and, and, he, and he mentions those specifically. D does God yearn for you? Does he love you? Does he provide you mercies? And the answer is most definitely yes. You had 2 Corinthians 1.3. Read that for me again if you would. Okay. 
Okay, so here, here it's describing God is the God of all comfort. We talked about the comfort of love. He, he's the God of mercies. He, he's, he, he definitely has a desire for us. In fact, God so loved the world, bowels, that he gave his only begotten son. All right, God loves you. He demonstrated that. He has bowels of compassion. He has um, uh, the yearnings in, internal uh, for, for us. He wants us to know his love for us. He says, so that if there are any bowels and mercies, any compassions, any affections, any mercies that are provided, and uh, most definitely any Christian who's been to the foot of the cross and accepted Christ as their Savior understands that God is a God of love. He's a God of mercy. We have hope. Everything that we have in our life, every good gift, every perfect gift cometh down from above from the Father of lights. Uh, all, that, all that we have good in our life is because of him. Every hope that we have in life is because of him. These are bowels and mercies that are provided. God loves us. And he says, if there be therefore any consolation of Christ, yes, there is. If there be any comfort of love, yes, there is. If there be any fellowship of the Spirit, yes, there is. If there are any bowels and mercies, oh, most definitely there is. Then he says, here's what I want you to do. If the answer is this, then this is what I want you to do. He could have easily said, if, if, if water's wet, if fire's hot, if rocks are hard, all right, the answer is yes, water's wet. Yes, fire is hot. And yes, rocks are hard. All right, he, he's, he's doing, going through the same process. So he says, if those are true, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> my family's from Kentucky uh, originally, and uh, they used to, uh, you'd hear often, you know, well, if the Pope's a Catholic, Anybody ever heard that before? If a chicken has lips? And the answer is no. You know, statements like that. And that's what Paul's doing here, much more spiritual than what those would be. Uh, but he's saying, hey, listen, if there are these things, and the answer is yes, 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 and yes. He says, I want you to do something. Fulfill ye my joy. Here's the, the pastor, the founding pastor of the church at Philippi. And he's asking them, would you do something that would make me happy? Say, well, I don't think he should ask questions like that. Well, that's too bad. It's in the Bible and it's true. It would be like you're raising kids. Hey, you want to do something that would make mama happy? Anybody ever said that? You, you want to do something, <laughs> Glory, I don't think you said that. I think Mama might have said it to you, but I don't think you said that. <laughs> you want to make Daddy happy, and you give them something to do, and they're like, oh, yeah, I want to make Mommy happy. And it's like, go clean your room. Huh? Mom's warped. You're like, uh, you know, hey, you want to make Dad happy? Go clean the garage. I haven't got to that point yet. Um, but, but you ask him to do something. And so here's Paul. He's given these four rhetorical statements. The answer to every statement is not just yes, but most definitely yes. And then he says, I want you to do something. I want you to make me happy. Fulfill ye my joy. What is it? I want you to be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. He's telling the church, I want you to be a unified body of believers. He says, I want you to be like-minded. I want you to think the same way. I want you to have the same vision. I want you to have the same goals. I want you headed in the right direction. And I want it to be one effort as one body walking towards a goal. He says, I want you to have the same love that those bowels of compassion that we just talked about with Christ. He says, I want them overflowing in you. He says, I don't want this person to have a different kind of love than this person. He says, I want you to have Christ love. I want you to know the love of Christ and to demonstrate the love of Christ one to another. He says, I want you to be of one accord. That's in one agreement. I don't want you to disagree. The color of the carpet doesn't matter. The paint on the walls doesn't matter. It's the gospel that matters. I want you to have one focus, and that's one accord, one agreement. Agreement. Why are we here? We're here to get the gospel out. 
Now, we're here to help one another and, and, and encourage one another and do all that, but the sole purpose of the church is to carry out the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we're not all in one accord on that issue, guess what? We've not fulfilled Paul's joy. He said, I want the church at Philippi. He said, church members, this is what I want you to do. I want you to make me happy. He says, I want you to be of like-mindedness. I want you to think the same way. He says, I want you to have the same love, and I want you to be of one accord. He says, I want you of one mind. He's talking about the unification of that body of believers. We're not talking about the universal church. We're talking about the local church. He wrote this, he wrote this letter to the local church at Philippi. He says, listen, you as a body of believers need to be of one mind, one heart one passion and when you do that he says you make me very happy you make me very happy i bet if you surveyed the pastors of america and asked them would it make you happy if your church was like-minded having the same love being of one accord and of one mind would you like that wow what we couldn't do for the gospel. Pastors' minds everywhere to be blown as they think of, uh, of the power of the unified church accomplishing great things for the cause of Christ. He says, I want you to fulfill me my, my joy. He says, I want you to make me happy. Do this. Be like-minded. Have the same love. Be of one accord. Be of one mind. He's talking about the unity of the church. And then he says, listen, this is how you're going to do it. He says, I'm going to give you four things Four things on how to be unified as a body of believers. And that's the next two verses. Let's look at those real quick. Unified as a body of believers. Number one, he says, let nothing be done through strife. Let nothing be done through strife. And, and it's basically the idea, let nothing be done through, through selfish ambition, through strife. I'm going to tear others down and I'm going to raise others up. How many times have you, if you've read through the Pauline epistles and you've noticed, he says, there are some that have crept in unawares. There are teachers desiring to, to, to heap to themselves. He says, there are these guys that come in, wolves in sheep's clothing. Over and over and over again, he challenges the churches, the church of Galatia, uh, who has so, uh, the church of Colossae, who has so easily bewitched you. Uh, there's guys that come in and they're trying to do things. In the book of Acts, they have uh, uh, Simon the sorcerer, and he's like, oh, I desire to have that too because he saw how it did things and made them popular and I want that too why that's that's that strife he's talking about that's that I, I'm selfish ambition I want to elevate myself amongst everybody else so that I can get the praise and the glory for it he says don't don't let that be in you don't let that be in you and and you know what we we've been in churches all of us have been in churches where you've seen people like that and you know, well I'm I'm the Head Sunday school department teacher, and I'm um, I'm very special. Yes, I know very much. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. Time out. That that strife. That strife. You're you're creating conflict when you do that. He he says I I want everybody, everybody like minded, everybody having the same love, everybody being of one accord, everyone of one mind. He says because if you're doing things through strife elevating myself at the expense of others he he says you're, you're not promoting unity in the church what we'll see here is oftentimes what we do in the church isn't necessarily bad but we can make it so that it's not good it's the reason why we do it it's the reason why we do it uh, why, why do, you know, Brett and Tanya, why, why do you lead our children's program? Because they were the only ones dumb enough to say yes. <laughs> uh, but in all sincerity, we, we were praying for a, a children's pastor and, and uh, asking folks to pray for it. And Brett, and with his servant's heart, said, hey, I'll, I'll fill in until you find one. He's still it. <laughs> we're still looking. <laughs> But he and Tanya do such a great job. Why? It was the right spirit. It was the right person. I, I'm just here to help. If I can help and this can be a blessing, let me do it. Great. Doing a fine job. Doing a wonderful job. Our, our, our kids love junior church. Our kids love it. 
My, my teens enjoy uh, spending time with them in Awanas on Wednesday nights. Love it. Love what Brett and Tanya do. And, and that's what God is saying. He says, listen, let nothing be done through strife. He says, let's take out of the equation the selfish ambition that says, you know, I'm, I'm special because. I'm doing this because. I, I want this because. Then he says there, the, the second statement, he says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. So also, let nothing be done through vainglory. And what that means is, is don't do anything uh, through conceit. Conceit, which is an excessively favorable opinion of oneself. I'm, uh, I'm God's gift to the bus ministry. Right? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm God's gift to, uh, to teaching. I'm special. You know, everybody comes to me for advice. Go, Wait, hold on, time out. No, that's, that's not why we do things. When, when we do them, and we're not going to do them, he says, let nothing, let nothing be done through vainglory. You know what, there's, there's, there's people out there who will say, you know, I'm a, I scrub the toilets in our church, trying to promote their humility. It's kind of, you can't do that. You can't promote humility. It's oxymoronic. No, I, I, David said, I'd, I'd rather be a doorkeeper. I'd rather hold the door for somebody. He says, I, I just want to be in the house of God. I, I just want to be around God's people. I want to serve somehow. So he said, listen, there's, if, if you're going to have unity, you can't do anything through selfish ambition or conceit in the church. He says, that can't be a part of what you're doing. And he says there in uh, statement number three, he says, in lowliness of mind... In lowliness of mind, this is not assuming that I have the right to. It's understanding my place. It, basically, uh, in, in lowliness of mind, this is, this is what Christ was saying. It, it, loneliness of mind is somebody who recognizes the log in their eye before they start talking about the moat in somebody else's. They're not the ones that, that have to say, hey, you need to take care of this, and as they turn, the log in their eye hurts them. No, they, they see that ahead of time. I, I'm, I'm nothing special. I'm just here to help. I'm, I'm here to serve. It's my privilege to, to be of service to you in lowliness of mind. And then they use a word, the Bible uses a word that uh, we misuse today. He says esteem. Esteem. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now, we know the word because we use it today, self-esteem. Self-esteem is not a biblical principle. You will never find the word self-esteem or the concept of self-esteem anywhere in Scripture. In fact, God wants you to do the opposite. He doesn't want you to esteem yourself. He wants you to esteem somebody else. Well, don't we need to build ourselves up? Remember comfort of love, fellowship of the Spirit. I just realize, here's what I need to do as a human being. I need to realize I'm a sinner and that without Christ I can do nothing. If I can get that figured out in my life, then you know what? Everything else is going to fall in place. I don't have to build myself up. You can do it. God, I'm, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm a sinner. I can't do anything without you. God, would, would you help me? In fact, the guy who's talking about this, let uh, in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves, I want you to turn over two chapters. So we're in Philippians chapter 2, and I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 4. He's going to finish up this speech on esteem, this concept of uh, looking to others, this concept of lowliness of mind. And in verse 13, he's going to say, I can do all things. Now, that's where most of us stop. We put a period right there. But Paul goes on and writes, through Christ, I can do all things. 
Well, if you've got self-esteem, guess what? You don't need Christ. Why? Because you're special. You can do it. No, I can't. You got it. I believe in you. No, I believe in Christ. You're going to make this happen. No, God's going to make this happen. Let each, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Esteem has the connotation of lifting. If I consider you above me, and you consider me above you, then a marvelous thing happens. Everyone spends their time at church looking up to someone else. That means no one is looked down on. Right? Loneliness of mind. Even Paul, who wrote the passage, I'm the cheapest of all sinners. So what am I supposed to do? Steaming. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lift Dave up. I don't want to put him there. I'm gonna put Fred and Tanya there. I'm gonna put everybody else up here. And I'm gonna put him, I'm, I'm lifting them. I'm esteeming them better than me. That's not a better Christian. That's not a better Christian. That's not a better warrior. Because if I'm if I'm spending my time on heavy stuff, I'm like, okay, this little game we got going on is not a lot of If if I spend my time lifting him up, you know, pretty soon he catches on. And he goes, man, I pass you and take the next guy. Like, you ought to work with him. And, and he's doing this thing. And then I'm doing that thing. So we spend our whole time lifting each other. So when people come to church, they don't find condescension. They find elevation. They don't see, they, they don't feel like, oh, I'm, I'm looking down on you. Worst thing, worst, worst thing anybody can say about our church is, well, in this church, it just felt like people were looking down on you. Oh, no, 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 hold on. Oh, hello, gentlemen. Talk about that for a minute. Nobody should be looking down on anybody else because why? The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Last I checked, we're all sinners saved by grace. Right. I don't care what you look like. I don't care. I, I, I just come to church and hear the truth. We said this morning in church, church is a hospital. We want people to walk through there to find the ministry of reconciliation going on. To be ministered to. To hear the truth. Because when they hear the truth, the truth will do what? We want to promote that freedom, the freedom to have a healthy relationship in Christ. Can't do that if I'm putting people down. Well, you know, that's here's my position, that's your position. I'm not going to prove work in the church. What? Oh, no. You just escaped the opportunity to do more work, that's all. Talking good to each other. Thank you, sir. Talking good to each other. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. It's, it's contrary to how we think in our society today. It's the antithesis to what they teach in our public schools. 
And it's what God wants us to do. Imagine if you did the same thing in your family. If husbands lifted up wives and wives lifted up husbands. If parents lifted up children and children lifted up parents. Wouldn't that be a great home? You think there'd be peace in that home? Think there'd be love in that home? Absolutely. He says, number four down there, he says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Here's the one fear that I have in this. Well, two. One is that we don't do this verse at all. The other is that we go to the opposite end of the spectrum. And we don't look on our, our own things at all. And, and that's not actually anywhere in this verse. It says, Let, look not every man on his own things. And a lot of us stop right there. We put a period. There's a comma. But we put a period. Oh, I'm not supposed to look on, all, on my own things. And you know what? I've seen people in service and in ministry destroy their families, destroy their relationships, destroy the people around them. Why? Well, because I'm supposed to be looking after the things of others. That's not actually what that says. There's one word that changes the meaning of the whole sentence. Anybody know what that word is? Take a look at it. Verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, comma, but every man also on the things of others. It's the word also. It's the word also. You know what? You're supposed to take care of your things. You're supposed to take care of your families. Doesn't the Bible say that a man that doesn't provide for his own family is worse than an infidel, an unbeliever? Well, if, if I'm not taking, if I'm not looking to my own things, guess what? I just left off taking care of my family. It makes me worse than an infidel. All in the name of serving God. Uh, I don't think that's what God meant. He's saying, don't let that be your sole focus. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also. He says, I want you to add to the things that you're responsible for, to your accountabilities, I want you to add the things of others. You know, and, and that's wonderful because in, in church and ministry, what happens is we think that ministry and church are exclusive of family. And so what we don't do church and ministry. Why? Well, you know, I'm taking care of my family. Or we do the opposite. We're so busy taking church and, and ministry that we don't take care of our family. Hold on, time out. How about bring your family and minister in the church together? Take your kids visiting on the bus route. Yep. We used to do that. Push little Josiah in the, in the, in the stroller and Esther toddled along. Actually, it was the twins at that time. The double stroller walking down the street, knocking doors. Hey, you want to come? Little Josiah, who's in college now, had, you want to come to my daddy's church? People stopping. He was cute. <laughs> I gave him the pocket full of tracks. Here, bud, go give that to that person over there. Come to my daddy's church. Oh, he's so cute. What church does your dad go to? And, uh, and, and he, he, yeah, it works. But you know what? They spent the whole day with us, and, and they got to see, they got to see, Daddy, that person that we talked to came to church. How encouraging is that to their faith? How encouraging is it when they're standing there next to you while you're witnessing to somebody and they get saved? Why wouldn't you want to include your children in that? Children, family, and church are not supposed to be mutually exclusive. We find people who are skipping church on Sunday nights because, well, not you all, you're here. But because, well, we need more family time. When did going to church not become family time? What you're saying is, I need time to sit in front of the TV. Because that's all you're doing at home. I need time to sit and play Xbox. I need time to do this. I need time to do that. No, you need to take your family and go to church. Make it a ministry. Make it a family thing. Include everyone. 
Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. How important could it be to your family to see mom and dad take a meal over to some other family that's in need? How important could it be to see other families in the church come over to your house and interact with your family over a meal, fellowship together? How important could it be for you to meet the need of somebody else and have your family see the blessing that was reaped by that other family? He's saying, listen, you've got responsibilities. You've got accountabilities that you have to be mindful of. But don't just pay attention to those things. Would you take time out to also look on the things of others and add them to your focus? Increase your focus. Expand your focus. You know, when... We come to church here, we ought to be listening to all the conversations going on around us. Not for the purpose of gossiping, guess what I heard at church today? So and so said such and such to so and so. Time out. No, that's not what we're talking about. But we could say, hey, I heard so and so having a conversation. And I get the feeling that they're struggling. Honey, what if we dropped what if we dropped fifty dollars by the house and, and just left it in the mailbox with a note? That's also the things of others. It's being mindful of what's going on around you. A powerful passage. He's, listen, I got a question for you, church. (laughs) Is there consolation in Christ? (laughs) Yeah. Is there comfort of love? Of of course, Paul. Is there fellowship of the Spirit? Absolutely. Any bowels of mercy, uh, any bowels and mercies with God? (laughs) Of course. Would you make me happy? Would you be unified as a church? He says, let me help you do that. Don't do anything through strife. Don't do anything through vainglory. He said, would you esteem each other better than the other? He says, and and don't just pay attention to your things, but pay attention to others' things also. He said, if you could do those four things, guess what? I'm pretty sure you'll reach that unified body of believers level. He says, I'm pretty sure that if you're not doing things through strife and you're not doing things through vainglory, if you're in lowliness of mind, esteeming others better than you, he says, if you're looking not just to your own things, but also to others, he says, I'm pretty sure you're going to get to the like-mindedness, the same love uh, of one accord and of one mind. He says, you're going to reach that, but you got to do these four things. Church, could we do those four things? Could we make sure we're doing things for the right reasons. We're not doing them through strife or vainglory, selfish ambition or conceit. Are we practicing loneliness of mind? Are we esteeming? When's the last time you esteem, lifted up someone else in the church? When's the last time we paid attention to someone else's needs besides our own? Let's try to do that. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody's looking around. I asked Brother Dave to come. But if the Holy Spirit did something in you, I want you to spend time during the invitation. Lord, help me to have the same love, to be of one accord, of one mind, like-minded with these other believers. Help us to be unified, God. Help me to do these.